thumbs up on this video and share it with a friend. All right, paintings, what you got for us? Coming in at number 10, we have the Virgin Mary lip syncing. This is absolutely insane. In 2015, parishioners at the St. Charles Church in Sydney, Australia, got a shock when they reported seeing the lips of Virgin Mary move in sync with the Lord's Prayer. For those skeptical, two churchgoers actually filmed the incident. The painting hangs above the church altar and is thought to have come from the Middle East. Footage filmed by young Catholic Christian curers was uploaded to YouTube, and I have to say, it really does look like the Virgin Mary's mouth is moving. It also looks like Christ's hand moves at one point too. Kristen spoke to the press and said, I believe it was a miracle and not just lighting because we all saw it at the same time and because her lips would start moving and then stop and then start again. Okay, moving on to number nine now, we have The Last Supper by Leonardo da Vinci. It was painted in the final years of the 15th century by the legendary da Vinci after he was commissioned to paint a work on the wall of the Santa Maria del Grazie Church in Milan. The scene depicts the last meal between Jesus and his 12 disciples as he tells them he knows one of them will betray him leading to his crucifixion. Now spoiler alert, it's Judas. Yeah, I'm sorry if anyone hadn't finished the Bible yet. Now over the past 500 years since then, it has been loved, praised, damaged by accident, damaged on purpose, repaired properly, and then repaired badly. Even the church that housed it was bombed during World War II. Rough. Despite this, The Last Supper survived, and if you want to see how embedded it has become in popular culture, check out all the TV shows that have done a Last Supper picture. It goes on and on and on. It's just what Da Vinci had hoped for. Next up at number eight, we have The Girl with the Pearl airing by Johannes Vermeer. Now I'd love to tell you exactly what year this was painted, but the experts aren't sure. Somewhere around 1665 though, but they don't know who commissioned it. And that kind of mystery is actually what has driven a lot of the fascination with this painting over the years. Why is this 17th century European girl wearing exotic clothing and a Turkish turban? Is it Johannes' daughter? And as the title might suggest, what is the deal with that pearl earring that seems to draw people's eyes to it so much? These questions have led to books based on the painting and even a movie starring Scarlett Johansson. Wait a minute, Johansson Vermeer and Scarlett Johansson. Conspiracy theory, huh? Probably not at all. All right, coming in at the number seven spot now, we're gonna jump forward a few hundred years for The Son of Man by René Magritte. Painted in 1964, it's become one of the most iconic paintings of the late 20th century. It's actually a self-portrait where René wanted to explore the concept of humans wanting to see something that's hidden. Well, this is what he actually looks like if you really wanna know what's behind the apple, but that's not the point. The point is, if you wanna get really deep, you could say this painting shows why people love all the art we see in this video. It's about uncovering the hidden meanings, feelings, and emotions in our lives. Maybe I should be an art critic. Or maybe I should just get on with the video and move on to our number six, and we've got The Persistence of Memory by Salvador Dali. From surreal to surreal now, Salvador Dali is well known for his mind and physics bending paintings, and this is perhaps the best example of it. Painted in 1931, it pretty much sums up what Dali and the whole surrealist movement were all about, breaking down our notions of what is fixed or changing, real or not, hard or soft, and for most of us, time seems like probably the most fixed thing in existence, always marching in one direction, never changing. Yet here Dali shows it melting in the hot sun like cheese. Dali would go on to create many more paintings over the years to come, but this was the one that actually made him famous at just 28 years old. It was the first the world really knew of him, and it helped set the tone for all the surreal paintings to come. Okay, coming in at number five now, we have The Starry Night by Vince. Vincent van Gogh, by Vincent van Gogh, by Vincent van Goggy, and Vincent van Gogh. I feel like there's a million pronunciations out there, so yeah, just take your pick. Now, sometimes people overuse the word iconic a little bit too much, but I think this painting might deserve that word. Painted in June 1889 in France, it's thought to be one of the best, if not the best, work done by the Dutch painter. Vincent painted it from the window of an insane asylum he had checked himself into the month before, and it was from this tortured artist that such an amazing piece came from. The focus is on the star-filled sky above the sleepy village below, but while that concept had been done before and and since, nobody depicted it in quite the way Vincent did. Instead of the stars and the landscape being static, critics say the swirling nature of the painting made it come alive on the canvas. As with others on this list, it's since entered mainstream culture and become very famous. I even went to a Halloween party once with my girlfriend as Vincent and the Starry Night. She did all the painting. I'm 
terrible at painting. And moving on to number four now, we have American Gothic by Grant Wood. American Gothic is an American classic. Painted during the Great Depression in 1930, it came to be known as a symbol of American spirit and resistance. That no matter how tough things are, Americans will stay steadfast. Now, although the pair in this painting look like they're from the colonial era, they're actually based on real life models. Grant modeled the woman on his sister and the man on his dentist. Here they are standing with the actual painting. But that was pretty trippy. The original inspiration came from Grant seeing a gothic window on what he thought was such a flimsy looking house in Iowa. And you can actually even visit that very house today and get a picture outside that house. Just make sure you look bloody miserable. Next up at number 3 now, we have Guernica by Pablo Picasso. This 1937 painting is perhaps the most well known anti war painting of all time. It depicts the bombing of Guernica that happened that year where a reported 1,654 Basque civilians, mainly women and children, were killed during the Spanish Civil War when the Spanish fascists requested that the Nazis bomb the town. For every person to see this painting there has been a different interpretation of it, but one thing that people tend to agree on is how it shows the absolute brutality of war. The broken up images, disembodied faces, flailing limbs and colourless canvas really show how surrealism can reflect the harsh realities of the world, even the horrors of bombs and wars. Guernica helped bring worldwide attention to that war and served as a reminder for every war to come, even the second world war that will begin just two years later. Now at number 2 are Bad Dreams. Displayed at Suru in LA, this installation was done by Axis and it's called Welcome to My Nightmare. Lovely. Her whole idea was that people are always so interested in their own dreams, they have no idea how interestingly bad other people's dreams can get. So she decided to create her own nightmares into art. One piece showcases an Irish coffin with an actual skeleton of a man in there holding a can of spray paint and a bottle of whiskey. And you're probably like, ah, oh, that's fine. No, no. There are also two huge live pythons just slithering all over the coffin. And no, no, it's not over yet. Within this glass enclosure is a half naked model. Just you know, just there as eye candy touching the pythons because you know she can. I don't even want to get into what other things she had displayed because I feel like that's bad enough. Is she fully okay not knowing what your other dreams and nightmares are, Axis? Really? Okay, no need to see any more. Done. And finally, at number one are the little girls. Also on display at Suru is the work of Chinese photographer and painter Zhang Peng. The photo collection on display just makes you feel a type of way. Honestly, they're just haunting. Peng manipulated the eyes in each of his child subjects to make them look more flawless, to kind of comment on westernized ideals of femininity that Asian media just emphasize. The subjects are real children, but the way the artist has manipulated them literally makes them look like creepy dolls with like sad ass eyes. One piece is of a little girl holding a sharp knife ready to cut her birthday cake. Except the birthday cake has her dead goldfish all over it that she'd killed, and she has blood all over her dress, and you can imagine her eyes just big, dark, haunting. Another one is of a girl in a bathtub filled with blood. There are body parts floating over her in the tub and what makes it worse are like the blood streaks that are streaming down the bathtub. And then the girl obviously right in the middle looking at you like I don't even know. Now the worst one for me in the collection was a tiny girl in a wedding dress. The girl literally looks 5 years old at best. She's tiny, she's crying, she's in a wedding dress and she's heavily pregnant. I just can't get that eyes out of my head like I really can't. Like I hope when the pictures flash up like you guys know what I mean. Coming at number 10 we have Scream by Edvard Munch. Painted in 1893, it's one of the most recognizable images to this day. Scholars have spent over a hundred years debating who or what the screamer is, but Edvard himself said it was simply a scream he felt passing through nature. Either way, words aren't really needed to explain the horror in this figure's face, something every human can relate to. Perhaps that's why it has entered pop culture over the years and been parodied time and time again. Coming in at number 9 are the skulls. Josef Hertel was an Austrian anatomist who taught lessons and showed preparations of animals as nervous systems, their kidneys, their skeletons and most importantly their skulls. Now he grew a huge fascination with the meaning behind skulls when his brother gave him the skull attributed to Mozart. And I'm not weird or anything but I'd also want to see Mozart's skull. This is just me, he's a genius, I'd want to see it. Josef started collecting skulls and grew a collection of about 139 and he did it to dis 
disprove the teachings of phrenologists who claimed cranial features could be used as evidence of intelligence and personality and that skulls differed based on what race you were. I don't know what to say to that. that, that. Now Yosef was like that sounds like a whole load of bull so he collected a bunch of Caucasian skulls from Europe to show they're all different despite them all being the same race. The collection is located in the Muta Museum in Philadelphia and each skull is mounted on a stand with that person's age, cause of death, etc. And honestly, it's freaky, I'm not gonna lie. Just imagine a hundred plus skulls all lined up next to each other. It looks like a trophy case for a serial killer. One that I'm not interested in, quite frankly. At number eight, we have Cupboard 55. Now, unless you're an avid museum goer like I am, you may not know about the hidden cabinets. The hidden secret sex cabinets, that is. These cabinets are usually tucked away behind curtains, shutters, etc., and are only open for a certain group of people. They contain risque art that apparently no one wanted seen even now. An example of this is Cupboard 55, located in the Secretum at the British Museum in London. The cabinets of obscene objects was created in 1865 and houses everything that was frankly way too saucy for the general public. Dr. Alfred Witt presented the collection to the museum as what he called the symbols of the early worship of mankind, which is just a really fancy way of saying he collected a lot of dicks. He collected every representation of the phallus in every place he travelled. I'm talking Egyptian dicks, Roman dicks, medieval dicks, dicks with eyes, with wings, wax dicks, lamps that are dicks. You get the picture. A lot of dicks. Now he didn't do this to create the setting for your next erotic fiction. He did it to show how different cultures around the world viewed sex and what their attitude towards it was. Okay, there's even a giant stone phallus wrapped in flannel that people thought was a pillow used by an aesthetic monk. When evidently it wasn't. Now this one isn't scary per se, I just thought it was a weird one so I was like, let's pop it on there. Filling our number 7 slot is the Medicine Man. Now the Medicine Man exhibit is part of the Welcome Collection which is essentially a free museum and library located in London. The purpose of the collection was to show how people viewed things like health, birth, sex and death over the centuries and the pieces are interesting to say the least. There's a waxwork of Queen Elizabeth I's face and half of it is her face and the other is a decaying skull being eaten by insects and that kind of just reminds me of the stuff I'd have to draw when I did art during like year 10 and 11, just decaying sh** and flowers. Another display is a bunch of terracotta replicas of feet and hands and ears and various other body parts that Romans used to leave in temples and shrines hoping for better health. But the creepiest one for sure for me is Black Madonna which is a 12th century statue of the Virgin of Guadalupe. The painting is gorgeous I have to say but her face is just black like pitch black. You can barely see the outline of any facial features which initially made me think it was just like a faceless woman wearing a dress. I mean she has no eyes either. If I could see her eyes a bit like, oh, okay, all well and good, but where are they at though? Now, at number six are Unseen Forces. Now, this is one of the collections of the Museum of Bad Art, and it's filled with art from a bunch of different artists. One called Vanishing Woman was painted by Hannah Hamilton, and it's creepy as hell. She painted an apparition of a woman in a field, and the woman is like neon gray yellow and half see through and seems to be bleeding from her eyes. It's actually really well done. I feel like it's in the wrong museum. It's not bad art at all. Another really weird one is Crew Cut Dreams by Leonardo. The picture is basically a man stuck amongst like seals and snakes and other animals, but none of them look like animals. They're literally just long rectangular shapes enveloping the man, and the man himself has like the creepiest smile on his face that I've ever seen. Another one is called The Scientist, and it's by an anonymous person, and the piece is literally a skeleton sad over his lab experiment that went horribly wrong. It's mixed media, so that means paint, marker, latex gloves, oh, and of course bodily fluids. Safe to say this was a mixed bag. Coming in at number five are the funeral carriages. Located in Barcelona, I don't know who wanted to have a funeral carriage collection, like no I mean I do since I did the research, his name is Cristobal Tora, but still I don't know who'd actually want a collection about that. He apparently wanted all funeral activity in a single building and with technical developments and the creation of motor cars, there were a bunch of funeral carriages that just were now useless, so he popped them all in this collection. It features 13 carriages, 6 coaches, 4 motor vehicles and other just decorative death pieces I guess. He created it to show future generations how our ancestors used to transport the deceased because I'm sure we're all very curious about that. Like I'm curious about the past, don't get me wrong, like I want to know how cavemen really lived and communicated, how people survived after those head drilling procedures, not how dead bodies were taken to the cemetery. Sorry not sorry. But honestly all the carriages are so majestically gothic, like the fancier than the transport I take and I'm alive. At number 4 are the fetuses. Frederick Rausk was a professor of botany and anatomy 
anatomy and his anatomic collection at Kunz Kamira is morbid. It makes your stomach turn a bit if I'm honest and it really makes me wonder what was going through his head when he made it. The exhibit holds more than 800 specimens, some of which include an injected head of a child with a dissected cranium and yes you can very clearly see where its neck bone would have attached. There's a cut humerus of a newborn, gotta have a bit of that, a fragment of a child's tongue and mouth floor, injected fetuses of all kinds, conjoined ones, ones that have been injected with things in the womb, injected stillborns, injected mutated fetuses. I'm pretty sure the collection has an injected fetus of every month leading up to birth. Like, I feel like I, I, I'm speechless. I don't know what else I can say about this. Filling our number three slot is the hair. The Avanos Hair Museum in Cappadocia, Turkey literally made me gag, I kid you not. You know that cringy feeling when you're showering and one of your hairs is on your body and you're like trying to get it off but it's like stuck to your fingers? That's exactly the cringy feeling this museum gave me. It's actually located in a cave and calling it museum is a bit of a stretch because it's really just notes from all the female visitors who have come there with a huge lock of their hair attached to the note. Apparently the story behind the museum is that a potter was saying bye to his friend way back when when he asked her for something to remember her by. As you could have probably guessed she cut off a piece of her hair and the potter put it up in his shop and each woman who came in asked about the hair as anyone would. And after hearing the story they too would leave a bit of their hair. The museum started in 1979 and at this point it has like 16,000 locks of hair. Honestly if I had heard this story from the potter I'd be like oh I'm heartwarming great story what a nice friend and then leave. I wouldn't be like oh no hold on a second. No. No no no. Coming into number two we have The Dead Mother by Edvard Munch. Like Edvard basically just needed a hug. If you recognise his name that's because he is the artist that was famously behind The Scream. I don't like The Scream either. I mean it's a very very good painting and very expressionist but it freaks me out. However I have to say this painting freaks me out harder. Munch's work is notoriously filled with pain and anguish which is more likely than not down to his poor health and his difficult upbringing. His mother died when he was five which probably explains this unsettling painting. Now the painting is called The Dead Mother and was completed in 1900. The picture is already scary to look at but it gets even creepier when you hear what those who have owned it or worked with it have to say. Firstly the little girl's eyes are said to incessantly follow people wherever they go but worse still it is said that the sheets on the dead mother's bed rustle or move. Some have even sworn that the little girl leaves the painting altogether. Coming into number one we have the hands resisting painting. Ugh this again I feel like this has come up on a few top tens before and I do not like it. The hands resisting painting gained notoriety in 2000 when it sold on eBay for just over $1000. The seller claimed it was haunted and actually it probably is. Reportedly three people involved with displaying the painting died including the art dealer and the art critic who first reviewed the piece. Hans Resistim is a painting by Bill Stoneman. Now the name is said to have come from a poem written by his wife about her husband's adoption. In the painting a boy is seen standing next to a creepy looking doll whilst disembodied hands pour at a glass panel door behind him. The painting was found abandoned in a Californian brewery which is where it seems the couple who listed it on eBay found it. Their wife wrote, one morning our four and a half year old daughter claimed that the children in the picture were fighting and coming into the room during the night. Now, I don't believe in UFOs or Elvis being alive but my husband was alarmed. To my amusement he set up a motion triggered camera for the night. Now the couple claimed that the motion camera even captured the boy exiting the frame under duress from the doll. It was also thought that the hands in the background move. I don't like this. Now the painting was bought by gallery owner Kim Smith who shows it on request. She does so less and less these days because people keep on complaining of falling ill after viewing the picture. Since gaining notoriety for hands resistant Bill Stoneman has created a prequel and a sequel image, both of which are horrifying. Starting us off with number 10 is the collection of weird objects. The Museum of Curiosity opened a gallery in 2012 that was what I can only describe as the weirdest art collection I've ever seen in my life. The first of this collection is an eyeball tray, literally I believe it's a glass eyeball tray. I hope, I hope it's glass. It definitely isn't real otherwise they would have decayed by now I feel. The next is the Marauding Horde by Tessa Farmer and it's a skeleton of two flies on a bigger flying insect which is just standing on a bird claw skeleton of some kind. Yeah I don't know 
I don't know. I, I don't know what to say either. I didn't know what to say when I saw it. I don't know what to say now. Tessa has many other pieces in the gallery that are all equally horrific. The collection also features a bat skeleton, a box of teeth. It's, I mean, it's just a lot. But the scariest pieces are for sure the insect battle ones. You guys have to Google Tessa Farmer's work. You'll be equally in awe and equally disgusted. Uh, how do you even prop up skeletons of ants that way? I don't even know. They're just tiny. Coming in at number nine, we have the anguished man. I absolutely cannot stand looking at this picture. I know that art is subjective, but I can't imagine having to look at this painting ever, let alone having it as a focal spot in my home. This painting is called The Anguished Man, and the urban legend goes that it was painted with the artist's own blood, mixed with oil shortly before they killed themselves. That's right, painted in blood, then they committed suicide. Great! Once again, why would you ever hang this? The owner, Sean Robinson, was handed down the painting by his grandmother, but claims he doesn't display it because nobody likes it, and I wonder why. On the few times that he has displayed the picture, he and his family have reported strange goings on such as bangs and voices and strange smells. They even reported that the painting moves of its own accord. Trying to find proof, Sean set up a camera in his spare room and recorded the activity over the evening. This is a piece of the footage that was recorded in June 2011. That's right, there it is. Now according to Sean, the painting was at an angle and against the wall and there was no drafts present so it should not have been able to fall like that. This next one is a little bit of an urban legend, but stories are all over the internet. Coming in at number 8, we have Sonny's suicide painting. So according to urban legend, a teenage Japanese girl called Sonny drew this picture and then scanned it into her computer and uploaded it to the internet. The image reportedly had quite the effect on viewers, who said that they saw sadness in her eyes, they also saw her face change expressions after staring at her. In South Korea, the story garnered a lot of momentum and people would claim that they stared at her for longer than 5 minutes, her face would twist into a taunting smirk. According to the legend, some people who stared at the picture for longer than those five minutes were compelled to commit suicide. Now it turns out it is all just an urban legend though, and the picture is by an artist called Robert Klang. The girl in the image is a fictional character called Princess Rue. Coming in at number seven, we have the misty painting of Bernardo de Galvez. Look at this majestic fellow. This is powerful historical Spaniard Bernardo de Galvez, who was instrumental in the Spanish military in the late 1700s. The city of Galveston in Texas is named after him, as is the city hotel, Hotel Galvez. In the hotel, there is an oil painting of Bernardo that is reportedly haunted by none other than the chap himself. The painting sits at the end of the downstairs hallway and is quite the feature. Despite being a beautiful old painting, a lot of the guests at the hotel simply don't like it one bit. A lot of people have complained that they feel cold when they're near the painting, and almost all guests of the hotel will tell you that they feel Bernardo's eyes moving to watch you. It seems if you try and take a picture of the painting without asking permission of the late great Bernardo de Galvez, it will come out blurry. However, if you ask nicely, the picture will be clear. Those eyes though, I mean, they're clearly seeing you. Coming in at number six, we have the painting of Ivan the Terrible and his son Ivan. This 1885 painting by Russian realist artist Ilya Repin has been causing a stir since it was created. The painting shows a more mortally wounded Ivan being cradled by his Tsar father, who has wounded him. It is reported in history that he murdered him, although a lot of critics challenge the historical accuracy of that statement and this painting. Nonetheless, it is one of the most famous Russian classics, and it is currently in the Moscow State Tetchikov Gallery. When the painting was first unveiled, a lot of people claim to be deeply unsettled by it. Some say they saw something terrible within the picture, other than the already terrible subject matter. In 1913, a mentally ill man slashed the painting with a knife and it was restored by Repin himself. Once again, the painting was slashed in 2018 by a visitor to the Moscow Museum. Now He reported to be shouting that he saw terrible images moving within the picture. The man was identified as Igor Podporin, who claimed that he was overwhelmed by something. He later blamed vodka for his outburst. Coming in at number five, we have Love Letters. Love Letters is a painting of a four-year-old girl, Samantha Houston, who was painted by Richard King in the style of a pre-existing work by Charles Trevor Garland. Samantha was the daughter of a Texan US senator.
senator who died in 1887, aged four, when she tripped and fell down a staircase as she sadly chased a ball. It seems, as a tribute, the Driscoll Hotel in Texas had a painting of her commissioned. Now, this still stands there today on the fifth floor. It seems that Samantha's spirit may have imprinted on the picture, as guests say that they've heard her giggling when they're nearby. Many guests report feeling like she's trying to tell them something, saying that they've seen her expression change when they look at the picture. Coming into number four, we have a moving morning portrait. Now, this is a really scary video uploaded to YouTube in August 2008. Uploaded by Haunting Painting, it is called Scary Ghost Girl Painting Movements Captured, and that's pretty accurate. The painting is of an unknown child in the 18th century and is reportedly a mourning painting, a memento mori. This basically means a painting of a person that's died and it's been commissioned in order to remember them. Now it seems that this mystery girl is haunting her own painting. The narrator of the video says that she sometimes weeps and that occasionally her mouth opens. Now, this moment was captured on camera, right? Terrifying. Now a lot of people in the comment section are calling this fake, but honestly, I really didn't like looking at this picture while I was scripting this video. Coming into number three, we have a painting of a headless man. I am not okay with this painting. Why? Well, because at first it looks like a nice little depiction of an old station wagon. That is until you realize there's a freaking headless man hovering around in it like a decapitated creep. The artist Laura P painted this image in response to a photograph James Kidd had taken of a stagecoach stop in Tombstone, Arizona. Her finished painting was hung at an office in Arizona, but after three days, staff demanded it be returned to her. Workers said that their papers would go missing and that the painting seemed to always move. They reported that despite being constantly straightened, the painting would always become crooked on the wall. Laura then took the painting back and hung it at her home. Unfortunately for her, the weird occurrences surrounding the picture followed her. She said the doors would start opening and closing on their own in the room that the painting was in and a glass even smashed in her hand right in front of the picture. Laura has expressed a desire to have the image destroyed, regretting ever creating the painting. She is worried what will happen if she does have it destroyed though. She doesn't want to anger the spirit. Coming in now at number two, we have the creation of Adam by Michelangelo. Now perhaps part of this painting is actually more famous than the painting itself. This part, the oh so close touching moment between God and humanity is the central focus of this piece on the ceiling of the Sistine Chapel. It was painted in about 1512 and is said to reflect the line in the Bible referring to God creating Adam and subsequently humanity itself. Now we're supposed to be seeing the moment before God touches humanity and brings it into existence. It's one of a number of paintings like this on the Sistine Chapel ceiling that took some four years to finish. A lot of the pictures on our list have been parodied in modern times, but perhaps the creation of Adam might be the number one for that. But it's not the number one on our list because that's what we've reached now, and that spot has to go to the one, the only, Mona Lisa by Leonardo da Vinci. It was once described as the best known, the most visited, the most written about, the most sung about, and the most parodied work of art in the world. It was painted sometime between 1503 and 1506, and if you strip away all the fame behind it, it seems quite simple. A woman in front of a landscape background, but as with most art, there are layers to it. If you talk to an art expert, they will rave about how technically brilliant each brush stroke is and the harmony in the picture, but for the average person, like me or you, they are drawn to the questions behind it. Who is she, and why is she smiling? Well, they think it's least Lisa del Giasondo, daughter of a wealthy silk merchant who commissioned da Vinci to paint a piece for their new home. Not a bad painting for a new home, I take that. Well, little did he know, it would eventually come to be the most famous painting probably of all time, to the point where you probably see more parodies of this painting than the actual painting itself. <laughs> 